Vport? Huh? Vports. We met Vports this weekend. Deborah? Yeah, I know. I know her. All right. Maybe you better check to see if. You know Deborah Newport? Yeah. I know Deborah Newport. Deborah. Yeah, she used to work for Elizabeth New Life Center for years. She said she still does. Oh, she still does. Did she say she does? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, she retired. It's good. Okay. All right. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming. And um, tonight we're on the Catechism of the Catholic Church. And we want to continue with our Catholic education classes. Let's start with prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Dear Lord, thank you so much for all that you do for us. For the gift of life and the gift of faith. Help us to live out our faith each and every day. But Lord, fill us with your Holy Spirit so we can know what the faith is. So we can know you. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, good evening. We are on um, paragraph 166. Page 45, paragraph 166. We believe. We're talking about the virtue of faith. Faith is a personal act, the free response of the human person to the initiative of God who reveals himself. But faith is not an isolated act. No one can believe alone just as no one can live alone. You have not given yourself faith as you have not given yourself life. Right. None of us gave birth to ourselves. You know, God gave us life and God gives us faith too. The believer has received faith from others and should hand it on to others. Our love for Jesus and for our neighbor impels us to speak to others about our faith. Each believer is thus a link in the great chain of believers. I cannot believe without being carried by the faith of others. And by my faith, I help support others in the faith. Absolutely. Totally and completely. We all receive the faith from someone else. For most of us, it's our parents. But there were others. There were religion teachers. There were priests and nuns. There were friends and neighbors and grandparents and aunts and uncles. They're just our classmates at school. I mean, there's just a lot of people who help build up the faith. And... Uh, I was talking to my son Luke just a few days ago, and I was telling him how so many young people today, uh, the median age of Catholics quitting the church, and by quitting meaning they don't believe anymore, is 13. 13. And, and I said one of the big reasons why kids are dropping out, why they're not believing, is because of what they're taught in science, what it, it, science, technology, and prosperity. You know, their lives are just caught up in these things. And all three of those areas tend to draw you away from God. All three of those areas today have no use for God. Uh, science, technology, and prosperity. And this, this is the world of a 13-year-old kid. This is 95% of their world. They want to buy stuff, and they want the new gadgets, the new phones and everything. And what they've been told ever since they've been little is, you believe in science. You know, science, now that's facts. You know, religion, that's fairy tale. You know, and so they're checking out like crazy and so and I told Luke I said one of the reasons is they don't believe in creation they they believe in evolution they've been told this this evolution story 
Talk about fairy tales, there's one. But um, Luke made the comment, he said, you know, when a teacher said something about evolution, he said, I didn't care. He said, I didn't believe it. He said, it just had no effect on me whatsoever. I said, because you came from a family that had a very strong, dynamic Catholic faith. It was like pouring water on cement. It didn't get in, man. You were impervious to it. But that is not where most kids are today. That's not where most Catholic, fa even Catholic families are today. Many of them are incredibly weak in their faith. Surveys show that America, only about 24% of Catholics even go to church every Sunday. And even around here, and we've done surveys in Sydney, only half the kids go, half the kids at Layman go to uh, Mass on Sunday. The other half don't. And so, and I think I've heard similar things about Rushi that I don't know, where did I hear? We have a lot, surveys show that a lot of our kids don't go to Mass either. Well, it's better than Sydney, but it's still not where you'd want it to be. And, and so if you have a family that's that weak in their faith, it doesn't take much to knock over a kid. And they lose whatever little faith they had. And so when they say that each of us is a link in the chain, each of us helps the other one stand in the faith. I, it's absolutely true. I think it's quite an understatement. I think it is incredibly important how much we help each other stand in the faith. Uh, yeah. it, the catechism is absolutely right. I just think you should emphasize it even more. We're, um, in, my, in my first book, I wrote a chapter on the uh, communion of saints. And there I said, I feel like I'm part of this river. I'm just a drop of water in this mighty river, you know. Like going over Niagara Falls, you see the power of that river, you know. And I'm just, I'm just one drop of water. And there's millions of drops ahead of me, and there's millions of drops behind me, and we're all pushing each other along. I mean, the whole river is flowing together. And that's, that's kind of my view. I mean, there's so many millions of people who believe in Jesus, billions ahead of me. And I hope there's billions behind me. And we're all part of this project. We're all part of this this church and I think it's very powerful that we help each other and, and it says that we, we have a um, um, we should hand it on to others I don't think you can help but hand it on to others if you really believe in Jesus you cannot help but pass that faith on to others if you really believe I, I think it's impossible uh, for some Jeremiah said, you know, talking about the spirit inside of him, he said, it's like fire in my bones. He said, I grow weary trying to keep it in. Yeah. If you really love Jesus, it's just going to come out of you. And, uh, well, I'm not plugging my books, but in my second book, <laughs> I made the, I made this, the case that evangelism is not rocket science, people. Evangelism is extremely simple. Live your faith. Just live it out. Everybody where you work, Nick, knows you're a Catholic. I'll bet. Mm -hmm. And from time to time, they'll ask you a question about the Catholic faith. You become the Catholic Mr. Know-it-all to, mm -hmm. to the people in your office. And I imagine the same is true with, with you. All you have to do, and it's not like Nick, I mean, Luke, he works in a hospital. He said, everybody in the department, they're always asking. He said, the doctors are asking you questions. Because Luke is a Catholic. And he simply, 
He doesn't deny it when it comes up, and uh, he simply just lives his faith. Maybe it's just an inner, innocent comment like, oh, at Mass on Sunday, the priest said something really good. I mean, he just might be saying that to a co-worker. And, and they become, oh, you actually go to church on Sunday. Oh, you're actually a Catholic. There's a lot of people who really don't know what the Catholic Church is all about. And Catholics are kind of uh, an exotic species to them. And, and the Catholic Church... Everybody knows about it. You ask almost everybody in America, have you ever heard of the Catholic Church? Yeah. Knows about it. They know about, know about it. About it. <laughs> but they know very little, many of them know very little about what it actually teaches, believes, practices. And so I am totally convinced to be an evangelist, all you have to do is answer the questions that people ask you. If you're living the Catholic faith, you will regularly, maybe not every day, but I'll bet at least 50 times a year, at least once a week, 52 times a year, I'll bet you somebody will ask you something about the Catholic faith in social settings, in, in work settings. You know, I get asked questions constantly. And so do all my kids. Maggie was in sales. And these salespeople from all over the country would talk to each other regularly. She said they were always asking me questions about the Catholic faith. Because they knew she was a Catholic. Not because she went out and said to anybody, I'm a Catholic. She simply just lived her Catholic faith. If there was going to be a, a sales meeting or something, she'd say, well, maybe I'll be there after Mass. Oh, you know, they find out you actually, you know. So it's just, what you got to do? It's just live your faith. People will ask you questions, answer the questions. I, I don't think you got to go knocking on everybody's door and say, hey, have you heard of the Catholic Church? <laughs> you know, just live it out. And they will ask you about it. And that's the best time to say something. When someone has asked you. They want to know something at that moment. They want to know something. And even if it's an antagonistic asking. Sometimes they might ask you a question thinking something bad about the Catholic Church. But that gives you an opportunity to dispel misconceptions yeah. um, I and, and I would say in my experience the the number one thing that I think made people realize I was probably you know maybe not necessarily like Catholic but a Christian of some kind is just the fact that I wasn't a potty mouth at work Oh, I mean, so I've been in an office and I've been on the clinical side. The clinical side, every single person cusses. Yeah. Wow. It, it's, it's, it's pretty I bad. know. Nick told me this and I was absolutely shocked when he told me how professional people <laughs> drop F-bombs and all kinds of stuff and oh, at work. Are you... I said... I mean, to make sure that they're behind... See, I work in a professional setting as a school teacher. If anybody did that in a faculty meeting, you'd be fired. Well, hopefully yeah. it's in school. Hopefully. It, but, it, and, you know, I mean, they, they don't do it in front of, like, bosses and stuff. But if, if you're, like, so being in the office, it's a little less. But if you're, like, in a meeting room with your coworkers and stuff, yeah. The, the, they, they'll start saying, talking however they normally talk. If anybody spoke that way in the faculty room at lunch, they'd be fired. Yeah, not the case. But I'm just saying, that's when people, they notice. You like, don't you, you, talk the way we you do. Don't, you don't cuss. Like, what's wrong with you? Like, what, why, why are you different? And that, you know? is, and that is so awesome because that is what's supposed to be. St. Paul says that when you're in Christ, you're a new creation. Yeah, we really should be a new creation. We shouldn't 
talk like the rest of society. We shouldn't act like the rest of society. Maybe somebody saw you eat your lunch and you actually made the sign of the cross and said a prayer before you ate. That would be a tip off. But you're not doing anything special. You do that all the time. If you were totally alone at home, you would do the exact same thing. You don't have to put on a show for people to find out who you are. That's a very good point. You don't cuss like the rest of the world. Well, yeah, and, and, and also just being, I guess, professional at work. I mean, <laughs> I mean, there is something to it, just being really nice and polite to people. I think that's also another thing. You know, what, what, you, say, well, what you say is really that's amazing. Amazing. What you say and how you say it, that's a big tip off. I... Your demeanor. And... And Phil, what's your occupation again now? I'm a, an IT over at Emerson, director of IT. I report director of IT. IT. Yeah. For Any comments about language over there? Multiple times. In fact, I've had multiple um, CIOs comment that I need to stop saying thank you. I need to stop being. Considered. What's a CIO? Uh, Chief Chief Information Chief. Officer. Chief Information Officer tells you what? You're too polite. I'm, I'm too polite. Whoa! You're too polite. Yes. What I, could be wrong with that? You're not aggressive enough. You're not going to pro be promotable. <laughs> yeah, there's been board level meetings at Emerson out in St. Louis where the 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 guy whose picture is on the the um, you know, brochure? The brochure that you get is sitting there throwing F bombs. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah. It's just yeah. it's corporate say, culture. I would say corporate that. culture. Yeah. And you're in a hospital, hospital. administrative setting. I mean we're talking but I'm we're talking professional settings. But I'm telling I'm telling you the 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 um, clinical side of a hospital is the worst. Clinical is much worse. Absolutely. Much worse. Well, see, I consider like a registered nurse an absolute professional. Oh, yeah. And I would never expect such a thing <laughs> to happen. No. no. I am really out of it. There's well, they, uh, nurses and like, I mean, everybody deals the with The culture patients. has become much more they, coarse Oh, yes. Then I would have guessed. And I'm sure you can attest where I had to draw the line. It's like, okay, I'll, I can, I can yeah. say something, but I ignore it. Is when they start taking, when they start G G D. This. Do you G. work in the public? I did. I work at, from home now, but I, even even when they're skyping comments, every now and then you'll see something like. Oh, that. Like, the internet! The internet is a cesspool. I know, but like, so I worked at BNSF Logistics, which was uh, over in Versailles, which is like a trucking logistics. Oh. And they would call and talk to the truckers, and yeah, and I guess that's where some of them felt like it was okay. But oh, this guy, this one guy, <laughs> was f this and f that, and then he would say, and I would stand up and I'd say, please do not take God's name in vain. I yeah, said, I don't like the f word, but I can deal with that. Do not say that. I yeah. find that very offensive. Oh, okay, okay. Well, that's a week great. Later, a week later, it's the same thing. We, me and this other guy, both, he, he was Chris, he's Christian and lived his, he said, I can't stand it. I said, I can't stand it either. I said, I've said something, but it just comes right back. So we reported there's this, uh, it's um, harassment. You can consider it harassment. Yeah. He was called in the office and told about it, that he was offending people, and he ended up getting fired over it. Wow. I'm well, there's another that, way of that. dealing it's with like, it. You know, there's another way of dealing with it. This is a little bit radical, but I love how... And I used to do this <laughs> sometimes. Anytime I had a co-worker who would use GD, mm -hmm. I would say, praise the Lord. And he'd say, why are you doing that? I said, you're, I said, you're cussing out God, and I'm praising him to make up for it. So every time he would say something bad, I would, oh, praise the Lord. <laughs> he quit doing it. I guess he didn't like to hear God being praised. <laughs> well, anyway, we got to get back to the catechism. That's fascinating. I, I'm really fascinated to hear that. Um, we're on paragraph 167. I believe 
is the faith of the church professed personally by each believer, principally during baptism. We believe is the faith of the church confessed by the bishops assembled in council, or more generally, by the liturgical assembly of believers. I believe is also the church, our mother, responding to God by faith as she teaches us to say both I believe and we believe. So, yeah, when you say I, it focuses on your own personal belief, but we say it together, we can say we believe. Paragraph 168. It is the church that believes first, and so bears, nourishes, and sustains my faith. Everywhere it is the church that first confesses the Lord. Throughout the world, the Holy Church acclaims you as we sing in the hymn, Te Deum. With her and in her, we are won over and brought to confess, I believe. We believe. It is through the church that we receive faith and new life in Christ by baptism. In the ritual Romanum, the minister of baptism asked the catechumen, What do you ask of God's church? And the answer is faith. What does faith offer you? And the answer is eternal life. So, faith comes from the church. We are the church. Believers are the church. And the church has passed down faith in many ways, through the sacraments, through the scriptures, and, and, and through personal witness in many ways. But it's through the church that we all come to believe. Paragraph 169. Salvation comes from God alone. But because we receive the life of faith through the church, she is our mother. We believe the church as the mother of our new birth, and not in the church as if she were the author of our salvation. Because she is our mother, she is also our teacher in the faith. So true, in baptism we're born again, and that's one of the sacraments of the church. The church is always referred to in the feminine pronoun as she. She is our mother and our teacher, just like human mothers are also the first teachers of their babies. Paragraph 170, the language of faith. We do not believe in formulas, but in those realities they express, which faith allows us to touch. The believer's act of faith does not terminate in the propositions but in the realities which they express. All the same, we do approach these realities with the help of formulations of the faith, which permit us to express the faith and to hand it on, to celebrate it in community, to assimilate and live on it more and more. Paragraph 171. The church, the pillar and bulwark of the truth, faithfully guards the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. She guards the memory of Christ's words. It is she who from generation to generation hands on the apostles' confession of faith. As a mother who teaches her children to speak and so to understand and communicate, the church, our mother, teaches us the language of faith in order to introduce us to the understanding and the life of faith. Yeah, it's so important that we have the Catholic Church for these 2,000 years to guard the faith and to transmit it intact, as we've said many times before. Lots of people want to change the faith, and thanks be to God, the Catholic Church has always been here to keep the, the truth of Jesus solid, steady, sure, unchanging. Section 3, paragraph 172, only one faith. Through the centuries, in so many languages, cultures, peoples, and nations, the church has constantly confessed this one faith, received from the one Lord, 
transmitted by one baptism and grounded in the conviction that all people have only one God and Father. St. Irenaeus of Lyon, a witness of this faith, declared, quote, Indeed, the Church, though scattered throughout the whole world, even to the ends of the earth, having received the faith from the apostles and their disciples, guards this preaching and faith with care, as dwelling in but a single house, and similarly believes as if having but one soul and one single heart, and preaches, teaches, and hands on this faith with a unanimous voice, as if possessing only one mouth. For though languages differ throughout the world, the content of the tradition is one and the same. The churches established in Germany have no other faith or tradition, nor do those of the Iberians, nor those of the Celts, nor those of the East, of Egypt, of Libya, nor those established at the center of the world. The church's message is true and solid, in which one and the same way of salvation appears throughout the whole world. We guard with care the faith that we have received from the church, for without ceasing, under the action of God's Spirit, this deposit of great price, as if in an excellent vessel, is constantly being renewed and causes the very vessel that contains it. <laughs> To be renewed. And I think that's the end of the quote from Irenaeus of Lyon. And, and what he's saying there is no matter what country you're in, and it's a wonderful thing, no matter what country you're in, we all have the same faith. We have the same Mass. We have the same seven sacraments. On Sunday, people in Bolivia and Japan and Ohio are all all saying the same Nicene Creed on Sunday. We're saying it in different languages, but we're all saying the same creed. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one church. It's, it's a beautiful thing. It really, really is. And sometimes when I look at, uh, on TV, World Youth Day, and the Pope is there, and, the, and you do, they have kids that come from all over the world. And it's just neat to see all these different faces and colors and cultures that these youth bring from all over the world. And there's one shepherd, there's one pope for the whole church. It, it's just a beautiful thing. And it's, it's exactly what Jesus wanted the church to be. Um, it's sad that there have been so many divisions over the centuries. But... Uh, I'm sure in heaven it will be all one. It will be a, a unity that we desire. If you're, if you're in another country and you're homesick, you just walk into a Catholic church and you feel at home. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it, it was like that in India. Wow. You walk into a Catholic church and you know, yeah. it, you just feel at home because... That's, Uli's been to India, and she spent two terms of service with Mother Teresa's nuns over in Calcutta, and that is an interesting observation, because India is a very different culture from here, I would think. But you walk into a Catholic church, and it feels like you're at home. The familiarity. That is cool. When we were in Italy, when I went, we went to Mass, and... Um, at the St. Peter's Basilica, but it was in Latin. So yeah. The whole thing was in Latin or Italian. Or Italian. Italian. I think it was in Italian. <laughs> and so it was like, didn't know a lot of what was being said, but obviously you could follow because you knew. Yeah, you know the mass. So, yeah. So. Yeah. All right. Well, we're going to section uh, two. The profession of the Christian faith. Uh, the creeds. We're on paragraph 185. Whoever says, I believe, says, I pledge myself to what 
we believe. Communion in faith needs a common language of faith, normative for all, and uniting all in the same confession of faith. From the beginning, the apostolic church expressed and handed on her faith in brief formula for all. But already early on, the church also wanted to gather the essential elements of his faith into organic and articulated summaries, intended especially for candidates for baptism. This synthesis of faith was not made to accord with human opinions, but rather what was of the greatest importance was gathered from all the scriptures to present the one teaching of the faith in its entirety. And just as the mustard seed contains a great number of branches in any tiny grain, so too this summary of faith encompassed in a few words the whole knowledge of the true religion contained in the Old and New Testament. Paragraph 187. Such syntheses are called, quote, professions of faith, unquote, since they summarize the faith that Christians profess. They are called creeds on account of what is usually their first word in Latin, credo, which means I believe. They are also called symbols of faith. The Greek word symbolon meant half of a broken object. For example, a seal presented as a token of recognition. The broken parts were placed together to verify the bearer's identity. The symbol of faith, then, is a sign of recognition and communion between believers. Symbolon also means a gathering, collection, or summary. A symbol of faith is a summary of the principal truths of the faith, and therefore serves as the first and fundamental point of reference for catechesis. The first profession of faith is made during baptism. The symbol of faith is first and foremost the baptismal creed. Since baptism is given, quote, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, unquote, the truths of faith professed during baptism are articulated in terms of their reference to the three persons of the Holy Trinity. And so the creed is divided into three parts. The first part speaks of the first divine person and the wonderful work of creation. The next speaks of the second divine person and the mystery of his redemption of men. The final part speaks of the third divine person, the origin and source of our sanctification. These are the three chapters of our baptismal seal. These three parts are distinct, although connected with one another. According to a comparison often used by the fathers, we call them articles. Indeed, just as in our bodily members there are certain articulations which distinguish and separate them, so too in this profession of faith the name articles has justly and rightly been given to the truths we must believe particularly and distinctly. In accordance with ancient tradition, already attested to by St. Ambrose, it is also customary to reckon the articles of the creed as twelve, thus symbolizing the fullness of the apostolic faith by the number of the apostles. Through the centuries, many professions or symbols of faith have been articulated in response to the needs of of the different eras, the creeds of the different apostolic and ancient churches. For example, uh, Huey Cumque, also called the Athanasian Creed, the professions of faith of certain councils, such as Toledo, Lateran, Leon, and Trent, or the symbols of certain popes. For example, the Fide Damasi or the Credo of the People of God, 
of Pope Paul VI. None of the creeds from the different stages in the church's life can be considered superseded or irrelevant. They help us today to attain and deepen the faith of all times by means of the different summaries made of it. Among all the creeds, two occupy a special place in the church's life. The Apostles' Creed is so called because it is rightly considered to be a faithful summary of the Apostles' faith. It is the ancient baptismal symbol of the Church of Rome. Its great authority arises from this fact. It is the creed of the Roman Church, the See of Peter, the first of the Apostles to which he brought the common faith. So, uh, <clears throat> the of all the creeds mentioned, I think the most recent one would be the Credo of the People of God of Pope Paul VI, only about 50 years ago. He wrote a beautiful summary of the faith, a creed. It's about twice as long as the Nicene Creed, but it's not terribly long. Creeds are compact, they're concise. They try to put everything in a small package. And um, that's one of the most recent ones. Um, but the most ancient one, I think, would be the Apostles' Creed, which goes all the way back to, some say, the Apostolic Times, and to St. Peter. And it was used as a baptismal creed. Before an adult would be baptized, uh, as pretty much as we do today, the questions would be asked. Do you believe in the Father? Do you believe in the Son? Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? and such. Paragraph 195. The Nicene Constantinopolitan or Nicene Creed draws its great authority from the fact that it stems from the first two ecumenical councils, the Council of Nicaea in 325 and the Council of Constantinople in 381. It remains common to all the great churches of both East and West to this day. The Council of Nicaea was called in response to the Arian heresy. There was a priest, I think he was an Egyptian priest, named Arius. And he started to believe that Jesus was not a divine person that Jesus was created. He was a creature. And he also did not believe in the divinity of the Holy Spirit. But the main thing here was, he was saying that Jesus was not God. He was like a, a semi-God. He was like a superman. He was above the rest of humans, but he was not equal to God. And so, when the Council Fathers got together at Nicaea, which is a suburb of Constantinople, where the emperor was at the time, the emperor Constantine, the one who made Christianity legal in 313 AD with the Edict of Milan. He called the council together, and St. Nicholas was one of those defending the uh, orthodox position. It, when you understand the argumentation that was going on, it makes the Nicene Creed so much more alive. When the Creed says, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, consubstantial with the Father. You know, all of those were aimed right at Arius, because Arius was denying each one of those things. And begotten, not made. That was right between the eyes of Arius, because Arius was saying that Jesus had been made. He had been created. And so every single article was addressing something that was of great contention at that moment. That there was huge argumentation over at that moment. There had not been huge argumentation over Jesus' divinity for the first 300 years, but Arius 
got all got everybody all jazzed about it. I'm, I think it was Saint Jerome. I'm not sure. I think it was Saint Jerome who who wrote. We woke up one day and the whole world was Aryan. It was like, where did this come from? It just happened overnight, so to speak. But anyway, that the Nicene Creed is so incredibly important uh, because it gave us stability in our faith. It explicitly enumerated things that we believe about Jesus that are very important. And then some years later, and you know, fifty some years later, sixty years later, um, the need was we have to explicitly state that the Holy Spirit is equal to the Father and the Son, and that the Holy Spirit is a divine person distinct from the Father and the Son. And so that was uh, held in Constantinople, and so eventually. The statements of Nicaea and Constantinople were put together, and that's the creed that we've had ever since. And we still recite it to this day. And I, I you know, I wonder, just personally, I wonder what a lot of people are thinking when they recite it on a Sunday Mass. I mean, they're just kind of going through it out of memory. I guess because I teach church history, and I teach about the Arian heresy, and I and I know what great argumentation and everything. When when I'm saying those words, they're extremely meaningful to me. You know, because I know what the other side was saying. You know, so when I say consubstantial with the Father. You know, it's like every Sunday, it's like I'm punching Arius in the nose, you know. <laughs> we need a creed that says, I believe that marriage is between man and woman. I believe that abortion is evil. <laughs> <laughs> people were raised with that and said that every Sunday. Maybe. We're, 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 going to, we're going to have to compose uh, maybe uh, a new yeah. creed that adds some believe. basics that were accepted for centuries and centuries and centuries, but which are now under attack. Exactly. But it's early in the game. I think nature is still going to have its way. Same-sex marriage is done. You're fighting nature. Yeah. It's going to be hard to conquer that. You're, you're fighting human nature. And it's not going to win. Anyway. Um, we're back to, <clears throat> excuse me, we're back to uh, page, uh, paragraph 196. Our presentation of the faith will, allow, will follow the Apostles' Creed, which constitutes, as it were, the oldest Roman catechism. The presentation will be completed, however, by constant references to the Nicene Creed, which is often more explicit and more detailed. is true. They're both pretty similar, and when people try to say them from memory, they often get confused, and they go from one into the other. Yeah. Um, the Nicene Creed is a bit more detailed than the Apostles' Creed. As on the day of our baptism, when our whole life was entrusted to the standard of teaching, let us embrace the creed of our life-giving faith. To say the credo with faith is to enter into communion with God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and also with the whole church, which transmit the faith to us and in whose midst we believe. This creed is the spiritual seal, our heart's meditation, an ever-present guardian. It is unquestionably the treasure of our soul. Yeah, it's a statement of our faith, and one should be willing to live it and to die for it. Um, well, we're up to paragraph 198, chapter 1, I believe in God the Father. I think that would be a good place to start next time. 
this this lesson's a little bit shorter, but we had a nice discussion. Let's finish with a prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Amen. You're at 132. Lord, we pray that you would strengthen the faith in us and in all the members of the church. We pray for all those who do not believe, Lord, that through the good example of the church, through the teaching of the church, through the Pope, the bishops, the priests, and all the faithful lay people, that all people of goodwill would come to know you and love you and serve you with all of their heart. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.